Hello, and welcome to the the Alliance for Democracy, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, Dr. Don Baham, filling in for David Doak, who's kind of under the weather, so he asked me to step in and short notice to interview his guests and have a populist dialogue with a fellow populist. <laughs> <laughs> and my guest for this show is Scott Sober, and... Uh, I'm a little nervous because I've not talked to you before except for a few <laughs> minutes before the camera started rolling. Yeah. And how are you feeling right now? I'm feeling well. I'm really, I'm actually really happy to be in Portland. I've had uh, so many great experiences here, but they've all been too short. So it's really nice to be back, especially at a community media station. Mm -hmm. And you're not yeah. nervous? I'm probably a little nervous, but okay, I'm I an know, extrovert. I was getting very nervous, you know. If you, I'm nervous and you're we, not nervous with me. I learned recently that extroverts sort of thrive a little bit on that energy, so maybe I'm... <laughs> I'm feeling good because of it. I don't know, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, welcome. I'm and it's a, such a great opportunity, so I, uh -huh. I'm maybe I'm, I'm I'm happy to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me read a few words about you and, and some of the print stuff I got on you. Okay. Uh, That's always awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Sober is the founder and director of National Intervention and author of True Recovery. Deep Democracy, The 12-Step Guide to Freedom from Addiction to Corporate Power and Money in Politics. And this is due out in early 2013. Is it out yet? It's not out yet. It's not uh, out yet. Uh, let me go on. And since uh, 1994, Silver has received as a, a multilingual labor and community organizer in social, environmental, and economic justice campaigns throughout the U.S., Latin America, Africa, and Europe. In over 30 states and nearly every continent, he has campaigned alongside workers in a dozen industries organizing for deep justice and regenerative sustainability. His international work has been, among other projects, in the faculty of Johns Hopkins University Center for Constitutional Studies and Democratic Development's Youth Organizing Institute. And I'm not going to do anything that's going to take that long to get the message across from now on. But I want to ask you a couple of questions yeah. on what I just said so far. You talk about deep justice. What is deep justice? I suppose it depends on, on the people being affected by injustice. And so wherever these communities are, where I've had the privilege um, to be part of their campaigns, I think that would be defined um, differently. But in general, um, a way of uh, thriving, a way, of, a way forward that allows um, for those in those communities to feel that their dignity is intact, that they can provide for their young without um, the experience of having to trade their dignity or, or trade a, a healthy way of being. Yeah. So this, is, this is a result of deep justice, what you just said. I would hope. I would hope so, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it's such a deep question. It's very, very difficult to go into in a short period of time. But of I prefer Martin Luther King Jr.'s sort of assessment of justice that we're sort of um, uh, get, have a feeling that maybe we're connected to a universal sense of justice, and that when we feel yeah. outrage or violation uh, or damage, perhaps um, we're experiencing injustice or having been um, taken maybe against our will from the path that we. Presumed was a path of that what he would call the long arc of justice. Yeah, the arc of the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends in the direction of justice. Wow, you got me going now. <laughs> you do those kind of paraphrasing uh -huh. of Martin Luther King. He's one of my heroes, and yeah. uh, my heroes are uh, brief aside here. Uh, uh, Jesus, and I'm a humanist now, mm -hmm. and Mahatma Gandhi, and Martin Luther King, of course. Yes. So you touched me. We'll have a lot in common, <laughs> I think. Done. And how about a few words about regenerative sustainability? Just a yeah, few words. I think that's uh, similar in terms of how, how each community can define their own. I think that has to do with our ancient practice as a species also of storytelling and how our story, if we are in control of it as a community, can provide rituals uh, and rites of passage uh, that allow us to reintegrate um, the identities of people who've experienced trauma in our communities in a way that connects us to one another and to our place in nature. So um, I think that 
area sort of refers to our resilient capacity as a species over the entirety of our evolutionary heritage mm -hmm. to find a way, no matter where we were or are in the world, to come together and uh, create practices for ourselves uh, that um, f help us thrive as community, reconnecting to or staying connected to our natural world and our place in it. So that's regenerative. Yeah. And it allows us to sustain as a society, as a culture, as a decent, yeah. self-respecting human being. Yeah, if, I think if we stay in control of our story, we can, um, we can promote exactly that. Okay. Together. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I've got no more <laughs> questions. What are you going to do? <laughs> We're set. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Now, you want to volunteer something we can talk some more about us, uh, look at a few things you've said in uh, this description of you and your life. Yeah, sure. I am. Um, I'm, I'm here in Portland as part of our um, national intervention, nationalintervention.org uh, Northwest Pacific Northwest uh, tour. So, I've been really fortunate to uh, get to spend time on campuses and at other uh, community media stations uh, in Washington State as well, and um, and and at uh, congregations and labor halls. Uh, and, and connecting with communities who uh, f sense, as, as a lot of us do, that there's um, uh, a lot of fires that we all feel are being set and to which we all feel drawn with our empathy neurons to put, put out with urgency, uh -huh. um, but that we want the capacity to somehow understand and find and bring to heal the arsonist. And, and so my work at, uh, here vis-a-vis -vis national intervention is to think um, is to help think folks think through um, what has come to be a, a, a kind of addiction to corporate power and money and politics that seems to be um, at the root or very close to the root of a lot of these symptoms a lot of these little fires we find ourselves putting out when it comes to genetically modified organisms or fracking or climate catastrophe or um, labor injustice, human rights violations, war profiteering. Uh, there are so many aspects that we can think of as symptoms. But when it comes to the illness um, of, of, of the disease of addiction, we don't find um, that it's just important to speak only about how we don't believe that corporations are persons, but that the people who do their bidding are real human beings. And perhaps they've become so addicted to using and abusing our power that uh, we see the same process um, that we would in other addictions to the extent that people are a threat to themselves and others. And if they can't stop themselves, we need to do an intervention the way we would with anybody who is uh, unable to help themselves but needs, needs that help. We, we tend to think in those communities that we just discussed, those, that kind of community with that kind of ethic that we would get people the help that they need. And here in our relationship to um, powerful interests, we, we understand that we may have to, like in, in abusive, codependent, toxic relationships of other kinds, draw strong boundaries. And so I've been so fortunate to be able to meet with people who have an interest in understanding what would it look like to draw a strong boundary, to understand the addiction system, to understand the role of enablers or suppliers uh, of wealth and power as workers and consumers or compromised voters. Um, and what, what would it mean for us to take responsibility in that relationship? So it's been it's been tremendous time here. I'll volunteer that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's a, a, uh, I'm a little troubled with your suggesting that corporations are, are not persons. Didn't our Supreme Court say that corporations <laughs> are persons? Like it's a direct reference <laughs> to the Supreme Court decisions. You know, it's been 150 years of um, slow and steady incremental changes in the Supreme Court. Um, th th that created what we now call the corporate personhood doctrine. This doctrine that um, where corporations used to be property of people, pieces of paper, mm -hmm. um, this legal fiction uh, th that, uh, that w you know, as property were uh, administered and controlled by people, have now over time taken this sort of 180 degree shift and become persons in the eyes of the law that have a great deal of control over people as if we're their property. Uh, uh, so, corporations, so if you corporations can't do, go to jail or 
Uh, Isn't that interesting? Be uh, executed. Uh, uh, how, how can corporations be yeah. persons? I wouldn't. Um, I, w I found myself some somewhat surprised to have valued um, nonviolent communication and nonviolent civil disobedience and the practice of nonviolence in one's own spiritual way. Uh, let alone our work in the world and our contribution in the world, I found myself somewhat surprised um, in equating personhood to biological humans and the way we treat biological humans in our society mm -hmm. and personhood yeah, yeah. to corporations uh, that, that I would support the death penalty for uh, corporate persons, uh, the, the corporation, um, not human beings, of course. Oh, if yeah. they... Uh, but but the, but the, but okay. this non biological entity, if they commit mass murder, for example, and can't and can't stop, for example, British Petroleum and the and the Gulf Oil catastrophe in t in April 2010, you know their criminal penalty for that was about 20 percent of their revenue. So imagine if you killed 11 workers um, and you knew the, the the precautions you need to take to prevent that and you knew you'd make a lot of money if you skipped those precautions and imagine if you'd done it before in Texas City and you'd done it before that and you've created this ecological disaster and it, and, and it, and it just had these unbelievable ramifications and you only had to pay at the end of the day of your next year's revenue your next year's profits which was 50.3 billion dollars if you're this corporate person uh, in the following year that would amount to nine and a half hours of of income for you per per worker killed what well, isn't that enough so yeah, if you think four weeks of, of, of a sentence, uh, 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 which is what that amounts to for British Petroleum as a per person, is enough for the murder of, of those 11 people, preventable, at least preventable deaths, um, then, then, it's a uh, then it's enough. If you think somebody who has a pattern of masterminding, a way of making money as a corporate person, regardless of the welfare of others, meeting the criteria of psychopath, um, at every of the seven uh, areas of criteria for diagnosing psychopathy, if that's the, per the kind of person a corporation is, then we could, in fact, apply the same Death penalty. rules. Yeah, we could. We could. They, the, the, in this example, they have three hundred billion dollars of of uh, of net worth, and that's more than sixty-two of the world's countries' gross domestic products combined. So, if you were able to um, commit a, a, an act of execution for a corporation, so that it couldn't resurrect as another corporate person uh, committing this mass serial murder, uh, the way you would do it is to to take that wealth away from from. Uh, the legal fiction of the corporation and it, and it wouldn't be able to exist anymore. So that is a good point that you make. If we were going to apply the death penalty to human beings but not to these persons, um, there is there is an inconsistency, inconsistency there. We should get rid of the death penalty for human beings or apply it to corporate persons who are mass serial murderers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you won't get an argument from me there. Yeah. So... Well, I had three or four things you said there I wanted to challenge you on, but you're going, you, 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 you got a heck of a brain on you. Know? <laughs> it's it's, yeah, it's yeah. A, a mixed blessing, I can assure you, <laughs> whatever's going on in this head. <laughs> National intervention, a nationwide nonpartisan grassroots campaign setting a deadline to f federal ratification of an amendment to abolish both corporate personhood and money in politics. Do you think that there's a problem with money in politics? Um, is it money speech? The other, the other part of this, the Supreme Court ruling, and and um, the money and speech issue. You know, the t two main main um, citable Supreme Court cases: Buckley versus Vallejo and Citizens United, with yeah. which people have become so familiar. Um, and and still on the heels of it, it's built on the underpinning premise that corporations have personhood that they you know the word corporation hasn't been mentioned once in, the, in our the entirety of our constitution and yet these civil liberties civil these hum, human rights have been applied to corporations as people as human beings and uh, protections from um, search and seizure um, that allow uh, a company to hide the ingredients of its fracking fluid for example um, from public public view and now uh, uh, the, the the real sinister piece of a ruling like money as speech in Citizens United is the anonymity. So yeah, it is a problem that $2.1 billion in political ads was spent in 2008 before Citizens United. That is a problem because you and I can't compete with $2.1 billion in political ads, uh, generally speaking. Um, 
uh, but then it doubled, of course, in 2010. The Koch brothers made heavy investments, put people um, that created uh, mass movements like the Madison Uprising in power, where, where people um, referred to Scott Walker as the best organizer they'd ever had <laughs> in Wisconsin. Um, and so, yeah, it's a problem. It, it, it surpassed $6 billion in political ads in this general election. But the worst part about it, I think, may be the anonymity. So I can't bring No a, one can be held accountable. We don't know whose pocket you're in if you're an elected official and you're getting money uh, from an anonymous contributions. So I can't hold up like a picture of a pocket with a doll and your face on it if you're my elected officials and say you're in Bank of America's pro pocket, you're in Goldman Sachs pocket, you're in British Petroleum's pocket or Shell Oil's pocket or, or Big Defense Corporation's pocket. I can't do that because I don't know. I can make the assumption and I can ask them to prove that I'm wrong if they want to create transparency. But it is um, really interesting that Luke Oil in Russia or, uh, or or a Chinese uh, mega corporation, um, or our own um, corporations that meet the criteria for psychopathy without the ability to feel empathy, um, but the ability to feign empathy uh, without regard for, for the welfare of others or the norms or our laws, without, with all these criteria of, of a psychopath and this record of destruction in, in the rearview mirror of the corporation as a vehicle for people who may be addicted to corporate power and money and politics, not knowing who who exactly are the masters they're serving is is a, a fundamentally difficult area of Supreme Court decisions to reconcile in a, in a democratic society. Addiction to corporate power, how do you intervene? It was just, if just we could agree yeah. that there was an addiction to corporate power. Who has the addiction? So there are probably a few layers to, 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 to talk about in answering that question. There's the layer of our elected officials uh, and the interests they're serving based on uh, what we just talked about with money and politics. Uh, you know, there are um, 13,000 lobbyists, though, uh, from corporate interests. Do they have addictions, the f too? And that's just the federal, the federal level. Um, and, and the next biggest group of lobbyists before um, we talk about that maybe their, their role in the addiction system um, is 13,000 corporate lobbyists in, in the federal level. The next biggest group is labor unions. Any idea how many lobbyists there are of, of, uh, 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 of representing the interests of labor at the federal government? No, I don't know. Compared to that 13,000 number of corporate lobbyists, it's uh, about 430. 435 Is that lobbyists. all? So you have this sort of like little moon <laughs> right, going by like this giant galaxy <laughs> of power uh, and thinking it might have a gravitational influence <laughs> of significance. Um, so, uh, you know, you can quote um, a former Democratic uh, a, a politician from the state of Utah who, who became a lobbyist if you want to talk, if you want to see if they feel it, uh, um, the impact of the addiction system personally. Um, I can't pull up his name right now, but he... Mm -hmm. um, uh, he said that he had to become a lobbyist because as a politician um, it was so addictive that he couldn't, using his words, quit cold turkey. Uh, and so this was his way of weaning himself off the influence of that power. I thought that was really, really fascinating um, confession. Uh, but I, th I would say that in an actual system where a substance of wealth and the substance of power vis-a-vis uh, -vis political power or votes uh, you know, we feel compromised when we go to the voting booth. We feel compromised as voters. We feel compromised when we go to the store uh, uh, as, as, as consumers. And we feel compromised as workers so much of the time. Who, to whom are we being, feeling forced to give our power um, to get just a little bit back of our basic needs? And um, having said that, there's a substance that we're producing, a substance of political power, a substance of wealth, and, and we're producing that wealth. And so in the addiction system, there are roles. We may have nonprofit industrial complex uh, organizations who do really important single issue advocacy work. They'll take one step forward, but they won't mention, because it's, it's not really something that we feel we can deal with, that the underpinnings of the system have taken 10 steps back or 12 steps back. So when we take our one step forward, it's from way back here. Mm -hmm. And so you may be enabling the addiction system. You may be a supplier or a manufacturer of the substance. If you're a big, giant co corporation, you may be part of the distribution network or the cartels who distribute our wealth and power. Um, or if you're a lobbyist, maybe you're a pusher. So there are roles that people have. And just like in the lives of ordinary addicts uh, that we may know, or in our own lives if we suffered w w with addiction and struggled through recovery 
you'll know that your addiction cannot be supported without a, a support system for the addiction. And so uh, this is about discussing with one another uh, w what will our relationship be to, to, to this corporate partner who, who may have um, and these political partners who may be suffering with an addiction, it would be like being in your house in a, in a partnership uh, with somebody who um, has the behaviors of somebody who's not in control of their, own, of their own decisions because all they want is that next fix and they need you to support it. And if you start showing signs that you're not okay with that, maybe more and more abuse will take place. Maybe you won't be allowed to leave. Uh, maybe the kids will be freaked out for their future. Um, or maybe they'll leave and they'll abuse, they'll have foreign affairs with workers in other countries and they'll abuse them even more badly. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll have a choice about whether we'll be in solidarity with that experience or whether we'll beg them to come back, just bring the jobs home, um, right? So there's sort of a sick relationship that we have in discussing what we call the gross domestic violence instead of gross domestic product is a big part of what, what, what we're talking about when we talk about the addiction system. What's our role? They'll tell you that, oh, you can't end this relationship because the addict doesn't want to leave it. Imagine if you were in any other relationship and somebody said to you, you can't end that relationship because they don't want it to end. So it won't ever end. It leaves us out of the conversation. So we want at Net National Intervention to bring ourselves back in to an, an empowerment instead of an enabling role in discussing how it is that we could leave or at least draw, draw strong boundaries. And that, that involves you know, talking about what it would mean to know that they're in recovery. What's our social contract going to be? What's our relationship going to be? Are you going to ratify this amendment? and show us um, that you're not so addicted that you can't ratify an amendment that says corporations aren't people and campaigns should be publicly financed as, the, as a maximization of preventing corruption in our democratic process or, um, or not. And if you're not able to do that, then at least we need a new, new deal. We need a new social contract. We need a way of knowing how it is that you'll be in recovery so that we can come back into this relationship. In the meantime, we're in this relationship. We're locked in this house. We feel like it's codependent, toxic, and abusive. And on top of it, they're burning down our only home. So then I hear you talking about the players in this huge game, uh, an addiction racket. I call it a racket. But then it seems to me that there are the master addicts, or the overall uh, managers of this addictive system, who are the characters or the human beings who are the master addicts who have the power and who manage to have us all join in yeah. this round robin uh, game. Yeah. Who are they? And uh, that's a leading question because I have an answer. Yeah. I'd like, maybe I'd like you to answer The it. investors, um, the uh -huh. super wealthy, the super rich. Yeah, so you know, it's, it's really interesting um, and it's sort of hard to wrap one's mind around all the, all the players. But I will say that I've heard doing this work that, um, that, that there are, there's a kind of person in an ordinary um, addiction system where people profit from the sale of this addictive substance or the peddling of this addictive substance mm -hmm. who are on it a little bit themselves. So they may take a little bit off the top and rub it on their gums and then you know have like a, 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 a rationalization <laughs> right <laughs> so um maybe the investors are in uh, some investors are in there and some others you know i i am um i'm a member of a generation whose parents have um, a lot of retirements depend on their investments for example it's pretty hard to sit here and tell you that uh, you know my parents uh, generation or investments mine. are right sort of like so addicted but I think like it has to do depending on the investor and you know a lot of shareholders don't feel like they have a lot of power in Switzerland two days ago they had a, a, a vote on, on um, uh, shareholders having the capacity to decide on a maximum wage for the CEOs of the companies in which they inv invest, for example. Sounds like socialism to me. Something, something <laughs> like that. Uh, I, it may be a healthy response to an unhealthy relationship, um, <laughs> you know, whatever names <laughs> people want to put on it. But sure. I don't know that all of, you know, you have a lot of 50.1% control or 51% control in shareholders, where the 49% feel like they can complain all they want at a shareholders meeting, but <laughs> it doesn't really matter because the people who are, um, Kind of stuck in this way of, of getting the the real the real profiteers of the of uh, uh, use it as a next fix and they're not going to necessarily stop. Scott, voluntarily. I'm unhappy because the clock is winding We're running down. Out we need some more time. What do you have to say uh, that would be a value to the viewers about what we've talked about or anything else 
uh, that you think would be useful to them? Well, of course, we want folks to go to nationalintervention.org. We want them to sign up and, and, and keep, let us keep them posted on our local work. Uh, we have National Intervention Coordinating Committees. Um, then it doesn't it doesn't really start a new organization, but what it does is allow you, um, whether in current work or not, to sort of affiliate with the concepts at National Intervention and direct the the power of what it means to put out your local fires into a larger organizing model for going after the arsonists um, and SNCs, which are Student National Intervention Coordinating Committees on campuses. Uh, Boy, harking back to, uh, to SNCC and the civil rights movement. Um, you are a communist. I mean, we like so to <laughs> we like to an interventionist. An, an interventionist. And we like to use models that have worked. We don't like using models that don't work. Yeah. And so we do work on models that have been successful in this society: women's suffrage, abolition of slavery, civil rights movement, Vietnam War organizing, and the New Deal, the original New Deal in our approach to perhaps have to put together a 12-step national recovery platform as a new New Deal. So that's the stuff I want people to know about. I want them to go to nationalintervention.org and, and have their appetite whet by this conversation. How'd you get a brain like the one you've got? I don't, I don't know that it's as great as you say, um, I but I got, I got the deck I was dealt. Your, your, your heart is fantastic. Yeah. I appreciate that. It takes one to know one. So, yeah. so I'm glad you were here. Now, I need to say a few words about Populist Dialogues. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, Visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www.afd-pdx.org. We want to thank the crew for getting us on the air again. Thank you to Joan Horton, Janet Morris, Beth Kerwin, Roger Bates, Dave King, and Brad Leach. Thank you also to the staff here at Portland Community Media for the use of studio space and equipment. And thank you, the audience. I hope that you will watch us again in the future. Thank you. <laughs>